But God has put limitations on himself in order for things to come about in a way where we can participate in his creation. Along with those limitations, he has set the parameters and he has given guidelines. Some of those are known to us. They're recorded in nature. For example, we know that a certain thing is going to happen at a certain temperature. Or if you mix this chemical with this chemical, you're going to have an explosion. Those parameters are set, right? They're also recorded in his word. An example of this is found in the book of Romans chapter 10. Please listen and take these words to heart. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Think of Ray and Jess over in Papua New Guinea right now, giving their lives up the comfort of America, living in a very squalid place to bring this message to people. How can they go if they're not sent? How is it possible? Keep thinking on that. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God has set the limitations on himself as to how the message to keep those he wills to not perish can do so. One of them is that he has given us the word of God. And within that limitation, he has set the parameters. There must be someone who will proclaim that message. But there are then other implied parameters because a person is limited by time, by movement, by funding, and so on. A person cannot simply stand on a mountain, shout out the gospel, and expect everyone to hear it in all of the world and throughout all of Christian history. And so there are set natural and written parameters which must be adhered to. And yet, these are limited by guidelines. As we saw, faith is how the message moves one from perish to not perish. And that faith must be proper faith for this to occur. But some might then say that this dispels the idea of God's sovereignty. Rather, it upholds it. If there is a message of restoration with God, and if that message is exclusive of all but one avenue, and if that avenue has defined parameters and guidelines which come from God, then it means that God is sovereign over the very process which he at first seems to be incompetent at controlling. What this tells us is that God has put a burden on us if we care about what he desires. What did it say? God desires that none to perish, right? His will, including his will that none should perish, is actually tied up in our will in regard to that same precept. If our will says, I don't care that some are perishing, then he has allowed our will to override what he wills. Think about that. As you live in a nice house with a big car and lots of money in the bank, what could you be doing with that for people in Uganda that have never heard the message, for people in Alaska or wherever in this world there are people that have never heard the message? I'll read it again. If our will says, I don't care that some are perishing, then he has allowed our will to override what he wills because it says he wills that none perish. This is certain because Paul says that the message which has been given must go through us. And further, that the one who carries that message cannot do so unless he is sent. And so as you sit here unwilling to assist those who desire to go forth to share the gospel, your uncaring will is at least in part the cause of God's willingness that none should perish to not come about. How does that move you? Or does it just not matter to you? One